All right, so when you think about the superhero genre, it's not hard to think about the current state of affairs and the sharp decline of the MCU, a studio that if we're going to be completely frank, even without the bias, has thrown out a countless number of uninspired, half-assed, and to a fault, pointless movies and TV shows over the last half decade. But as we all know, the MCU climate and atmosphere wasn't always this way, and to be honest, back in the yesteryears, the glory years, the golden age of the MCU, it would have been easy to pick and choose your favorite movie, character, or moment from any of the different forms of movies that they were carefully crafting at the time. From the big blockbuster types like Infinity War, Endgame, Age of Ultron, No Way Home, and even Civil War, to the classic origin stories like Iron Man, Ant-Man, or Captain America, comedy actions with Thor Ragnarok and the Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy, to even having a good run back in the day with its Netflix shows like Jessica Jones, The Punisher, and Daredevil, who all just happened to make its way into the canon of the MCU. And don't get me wrong, I'd be lying to you if I told you that other studios haven't tried to also cash in on the mindless <coughs> <coughs> Haven't tried to make creative and action-packed superhero universes themselves, with some big box office success stories like Wonder Woman, Batman v Superman and the first Aquaman for some reason, I swear that movie will truly go down as one of the biggest wonders in cinema history how that movie was somehow able to gorge itself to the big B. Insane. But yeah, we all know how that turned out. My point is, while the superhero genre is extremely saturated right now with the same bottom-of-the-barrel formulaic Marvel movies and TV shows that Disney is so insistent on shoving down our throats, not to mention the irredeemable and now officially dead Warner Brothers DCEU, the barely holding on Sony Pictures who just admitted that they pretty much had to reshoot the entirety of their Madam Web movie because their writers couldn't be bothered to do the bare minimum of research required to know the timeline of their own film, and in a time where it honestly seems as if there is no hope on the horizon, desperate times call for desperate measures. And luckily for us, Seth Rogen decided to take his head out of his ass and put his heads in the clouds in order to create a show that was ready to make you second guess everything on how the superhero genre can really be made. And that's... Yeah! Oh wait, wrong one. In case you didn't know, Invincible Season 1 was released all the way back in 2021, a show that made its appearance at a time where you didn't really know that you needed it until you had it. When I mentioned that Desperate Times called for desperate measures, what I meant by that is that the adult animation genre has seen a dramatic boom since the start of the pandemic. And while the reasons aren't really necessary to go into for the sake of this video, the success stories of shows like Arcade, Bojack Horseman, Archer, Rick and Morty, Blue-Eyed Samurai, and many, many more have given us the opportunity of something that has been lacking in the past decade when it came to entertainment. Diversity. But then Kennedy's like, it's not our fault, it's because of Kathleen Kennedy. But then Kathleen Kennedy's just like, fuck it, make it my name. And everyone in town is like, no, please, Kathleen Kennedy, stop ruining everything. But Kathleen Kennedy is all like, put another gay diverse woman in it, make it my fucking name. And the Disney stock just keeps going down and down and down. And then Bob Iger is all like, eh, no, what's going on with my stars? No, Kathleen Kennedy. No, not that kind. Well, yes, that kind too. But implemented in a way that is designed to either uplift and create a narrative, world, or characters, and not just in the name of pandering. But with that being said in the same breath, when a change in genre becomes the meta, inherently there will also be some duds as well. But with the second half of season two being announced recently, which is still kind of crazy to me that Amazon is trying to sell an eight episode season being split into two parts, but people are buying it up, so I guess it worked out anyway. Before you get into season two, you must know what comes before. So let's get into... Meet Mark Grayson, an average-ass teenager who just so happens to live in a world of superheroes, with his father being the most powerful of them all, Omni-Man. A Superman type of hero, but interestingly enough, not like Superman at all. Without the abilities to breathe cold air, shoot lasers out of his eyes, and still highly susceptible to viruses just like any other organism, 
And let me tell you, there's a lot of death battle controversies out there surrounding this character and of course his inspiration. And I'm here to throw my vote out and say that I believe Superman wipes Omni-Man. But still, he's at the top of the superhero food chain in his universe, so again, it works out. With Mark's latent powers awakening on his 16th birthday, he finds himself being able to do everything his father can. Just nerfed and starts to follow in the steps of Omni-Man to stop crime and help engage in saving the world. Of course, while going through the normal character tropes, teenager edition, of trying to hide his secret identity and find a way to balance his old life with his new. But when the Guardians of the Globe, or basically the Justice League of this universe, are brutally murdered with no real motives, clues, and seemingly no evidence leading back to the culprit, including Omni-Man, a new but younger crew of heroes are forced to the front lines led by Cecil, a Nick Fury type that leads the secret organization of superheroes in this universe. The rest of the season plays out as Cecil and the others lead an investigation on what really went down, as well as following Mark as he finds himself in a situation that can prove too big for himself and turn his world upside down, leading to shocking plot twists, character motivations that were previously unknown, as well as deaths and betrayals from all of the people involved. And if that doesn't entice you enough to watch this show that actually deserves your time, well, it sounds like I gotta get to... Okay, so much like The Boys, Seth Rogen's other superhero project that just so happens to find itself in, in my opinion, is leagues above any of the slop that Disney Plus has been asking us to ingest. The characters are really the backbone of Invincible, at least season one. Mark is easily the most relatable character, and his choices and actions during his path in the show really reflects what I think a common person would do in a scenario like his. But as much as Mark's character is clearly the protagonist of the show, it wouldn't nearly be as good without the relationship dynamic and the character writing of Omni-Man. Being a Superman type, you're introduced to the character in a lighthearted and safe manner, being the father of the protagonist that puts the audience into a false sense of security and into the POV of Mark like everything is just going to work out. But when you watch Omni-Man brutally dismantle the entirety of the Guardians of the Globe and reveal the secret agenda of why he was sent to become the protector of Earth, you as well as Mark are faced with the reality that we're dealing with a psychotic, powerful, but intelligent antagonist. A character trope that has truly been a missing piece of recent superhero films and why characters like the High Evolutionary stand out amongst the trash like Bro Hulk from She-Hulk, Dar Dumbass from the Marvels, the Kang variant that gets overpowered by Ants, the Spoiled Brat from Secret Invasion, Carly from the Falcon and Winter Soldier, Ethan Hawke's character from Moon Knight. You get my point, and I'm sure towards the end there, I was mentioning characters that you don't even know or care to remember. If you haven't realized by now, this isn't your standard superhero show. Sure, there's the teenage love interest and the balancing of life, and I'm sure the majority of you expected me to make a con section of this video just to include and rant about Amber's character, which I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty tempted. But I feel like I would be doing the show, writers, and characters as a whole a disservice. There are actual stakes, convictions, morals, and cost for every character in the show, Deaths and betrayals do happen, and for the most part, permanently. The writing and character development are top tier, and as I said before, the backbone for why entertainment that focuses on characters are so appreciated. And more importantly, Invincible doesn't make the audience feel like they only need to have two functioning brain cells in order to follow the narrative. It's mature and detailed with every character and subplot introduced. And honestly, in the climate that we're in, I couldn't imagine a better show right now to scratch that superhero itch, assuming you still have one after decades of relentless scratching. But if you do, then Invincible is 100% the show for you. Of course, as always, I want to thank you guys for watching the video. And if you enjoyed, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. Unfortunately, I haven't even started watching Invincible Season 2. Once I saw that they were delaying it into a two-parter, I was like, well, I guess I'll see you when you're all done, I guess. I should say follow me on Twitter. I started a whole new account for this channel, so I'm going to start promoting that more. Again, I want to thank you guys for watching the video. Make sure to like and subscribe. If you did enjoy, 
why not click on more while you're at it? Otherwise, that's all the words I got for you today. Bye.